What's up, everybody? Welcome into Bet to Win here at the Blue Wire Studios at the Win Las Vegas. I'm your host, Joe Fan. Hope you all had a tremendous weekend. I had a wonderful weekend. I went back to Seattle to spend Father's Day with my pops. Got back on Sunday evening. Lots to discuss here. Unfortunately, I don't get to start the show with a victory lap. I've got an L to hold. I doubled down. As I said, any good captain goes down with his ship. You can't go off on the lifeboat. You've got to stay with it. And I did, and it cost me. Uh, the Celtics did not win the series. They didn't even win game six and force a game seven. They got blasted at home in game six. I promised champagne and mimosas if we, uh, if we got to cash this bet. Unfortunately, no drinks here on this Monday morning. Uh, the Celtics lose that game. Uh, it wasn't pretty. Steph Curry dominates 34-7-7. Wiggins, 18, 6, and 5, four steals, three blocks. Give him all the flowers. This is bu- it's a bummer for me, though. And I still won some money. I, I, I know I've been talking for months about my Celtics 25 to 1 future. And thankfully, I'm a part of Team Hedge. I know that's a very, it's a very uh, polarizing conversation in the betting community when talking about whether or not to hedge. And my thought all along was I would rather have some payday than no payday at all. Even if that means if the ticket cashes, that payday is then smaller. Like, I'm okay with that. I made this bet back in February. And clearly, it was an incredible bet. 25 to 1, they make the finals. And so I wanted to be rewarded for that. And so the way I did is I put a thousand bucks in the Warriors. I also had fifty bucks in the Warriors from the start of the playoffs uh, at like plus seven hundred. So that was to win three seventy five uh, or whatever it was three seventy five. I put I added it up to where I basically had a thousand dollars in the Warriors to where I would win a thousand on the Warriors and lose uh, or win a, a fifteen hundred on the Celtics. So still won a thousand bucks in the Warriors, but so I'm not a bummed a ton from that standpoint. But it. It was sort of, it was just kind of a boring and anticlimactic ending to a boring and anticlimactic playoffs. Game one was a lot of fun. The Celtics come back, all the threes they made on the road in game one. I'll give you that. Game two was a snooze. Game three was a snooze. Game four was epic with Steph Curry going off for a 40-burger. Probably his, his finest moment in his Hall of Fame career, arguably so on the road in Boston, down 2-1, must-win game. Game four was a snooze. Sorry, game five was a snooze, and game six was a snooze. I can't believe the Celtics laid the egg that they did in game six. Really, four, five, and six, but I thought certainly that it would be a game seven. That's why I, I sort of doubled down on the series price for my winning pick last week was I just didn't think there was any chance they would lose at home. And I said, they figure it out. I say, hey, we can't turn the ball over. Jason Tatum saying, hey, I've got to be a second half guy. Where our defense has to come back. You look at all the edges the Celtics had early on in the series that led to them being up 2-1. Again, the Warriors were plus 185 underdogs following game three. A decisive game three win for the Celtics. All their, all their edges went away. We talked so much about their size advantage. They were the more athletic, the more physical, the bigger team. In games four, five, and six, the Warriors out-rebounded them on the offensive glass, strictly offensive rebounds, 35 to 30. Now, over three games, five offensive rebounds isn't a huge discrepancy. But when that's supposed to be one of your significant edges, that's an issue. I also talked about going into the series and even through three games, the Celtics had, while probably a shallower bench, had reliable role players that they could bank on game in and game out. That wasn't the case. Peyton Pritchard, minus 20 in just eight minutes in game six, scored just one point in games four through six. Grant Williams, Three points a game, nine total points in those games. Derek White had 16 points inefficiently in game four, but still 16 points and just three points in games five and six. They got nothing from their bench. 
in game six. Conversely, everyone on the Warriors got better. Gary Payton Jr. was a stud. Jordan Poole, once again, was a reliable scorer and hit big-time shots. Talk about the run they made in Game 5. It all started with a Jordan Poole buzzer beater at the end of the third quarter. Kavon Looney was huge. Again, Andrew Wiggins, who'd been good all playoffs, was the second-best player in the series behind Steph Curry, better than Jalen Brown, better than Jason Tatum. A true two-way star who cleaned up on the glass. His defense against Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown was elite. You want to talk about 22 turnovers in game six? Give Andrew Wiggins a ton of credit for that. And outside of game six, a reliable score. Heck, Draymond went from unplayable, largely in games one, two, three, and four, when Steph Curry went off and carried the Warriors to a game four win to being a stud in game six, 12, 12, and eight in that closeout game. It's just hard to fathom Jason Tatum woeful all series, which is a huge bummer because I'm a big fan of Tatum. At home, game six, must win game. You get one second half bucket. Terrible in the fourth quarter, all series long. Only one game of the six where he shot 45% or better. And that was in game five when they got blown out in Golden State. He's still very evidently a step away from being in that top echelon where I I wanted to put him because of what he did in the postseason leading up to the finals. Beating Kevin Durant and Kyrie, beating Giannis, beating Jimmy Butler in a game seven on the road. And it wasn't just him, but he had the clutch moments to where he earned being in that conversation, but very evidently not there yet. Jason Tatum, not Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown. Sort of a brutal superstar to watch. The ebbs and flows of that guy's game where he he goes from unstoppable, gets a bucket on command, to where he goes through long stretches of forcing bad shots, can't handle the basketball, and he loses all semblance of body control where he's just throwing his body into guys. His turnovers all series long were excruciating. 22 turnovers in a do-or-die game at home. Again, hard to fathom. And you credit the Warriors' defense because their on-ball defense was greatly improved compared to games one through three. Their perimeter rotations were better. Their defensive rebounding was better. Their ball pressure was constant. They made every possession uncomfortable for the Celtics. The Celtics can't say the same for their defense against the Warriors. Marcus Smart, Defensive Player of the Year, nowhere to be seen. In game six, Steph Curry dribbling around him and getting to the cup with ease. Wide open three-pointers seemingly at will with just one or two passes around the perimeter or an easy drive and kick. That wasn't there. Uh, The defense let them down. It was comprehensive for the Celtics. So I guess... What's a bummer is, and the Warriors are a worthy champion, very evidently the better team. But I don't think anyone in Boston, whether you're on that team, on the coaching staff, in the front office, a fan, a better who was riding with the Celtics, you can tip your cap and say the better team won. But it's still frustrating to go into the to, into a long off season and know you didn't play your best ball and just get beat. There's a huge element of you beat yourself. You didn't make the Warriors play their best game to beat you and to be up 2-1 at home in game four and lose three straight, two of which at home, that's tough to stomach. And I think it's also important to note, yes, that core is still young when you talk about Jason Tatum at 24, uh, Jalen Brown at 25, Robert Williams also 25, but Marcus Smart's 28. Al Horford was a monster piece of their playoff run, turning back the clock and turning in to the peak version of himself, at least as a three-point shooter. But this is a team that's in the playoffs every year. So the way that the moment felt too big for them is concerning to me, and it doesn't allow me to just say, well, they're young, they'll be back. And they probably will, but we've been talking and having this conversation about, well, Tatum's just, he's just a kid. Just wait, just wait till he comes into his own. 24 now. Still young, but 
there are some warts there that have to be addressed um, during this offseason. I do want to put a bow on this and just say Robert Williams is the coolest. I love watching that dude play basketball. Truly one of the elite rim defenders in the entire NBA. He makes his free throws. He is a lot of fun. And if I'm a Celtics fan, his presence and the way he changed games when he was at his best, you could say in games five and six, he was their best player. And so having him at age 25, you hope the knees can stay healthy throughout his career because he's going to be a ton of fun uh, in Boston. Some odds to win next year's championship already out. Warriors at plus 550, the favorites. The Celtics, Bucks, and Nets at plus 750. The Clippers at plus 800. Suns at 10 to 1. And the Heat at 12 to 1. I don't mean to be such a negative Nancy about the playoffs. And it's not about just losing my bet. I said this on Twitter and I had Warriors fans coming at me. Cry about it. Oh, you're so... It's like it's not taking anything away from the Warriors. If anything, it's giving them more credit because they were that dominant. But I feel like the bar has gotten so low to where we're giving bad games a pass as good games. And it just wasn't the case. Outside of games one and four, every game was boring and decided well before the final five minutes of the fourth quarter. The game, game six, the deciding game was never within less than eight in the second half. Wasn't a good game, objectively. Doesn't take anything away from anyone. It's a bad playoffs. It's a bummer, and I love hoops. And I just leave with a bad taste in my mouth, especially given when you watch the NHL and these play- playoffs have been so good. Um, Thursday's NBA draft is coming up. We're going to talk that. Uh, talk about that on Thursday. Dive into it. The draft order again, Magic number one, Thunder two, Rockets three, Pistons four, Pacers five, win bets odds for number one overall pick. Jabari Smith at Auburn is minus 225. That's been juiced up overnight. Uh, and now he is the overwhelming favorite to be taken first overall by the Magic. Chet Holmgren at plus 125. And Paulo Bancaro at plus 900. Let's talk some golf, shall we? Because what a tournament we were treated to at the 122nd edition of the U.S. Open. This one at the Country Club in Brookline, Massachusetts. Matthew Fitzpatrick. Now, I'm not sure if you know, but he won a U.S. amateur event there at the Country Club. Crazy. Who could have, who could have forgotten because they win every five minutes without mentioning it. Uh, unnecessary jab at the broadcast. That's on me. But Matthew Fitzpatrick wins. He was 15 to one pre-flop on win bet. And what a round from him. He finishes at six under, a minus two on Sunday. Will Zalatoris, a bridesmaid once again. This man is four strokes away from winning three majors. Second at the Masters in his Masters debut, second, the PGA Championship, just a month ago, where he lost in the playoff to Justin Thomas. And then second, tied for second, along with Scotty Scheffler, on Sunday at the U.S. Open. He had a putt on 18, and he got a look at it because his line was right behind Matthew Fitzpatrick's. And Matthew Fitzpatrick missed it just a hair left, really comfortable two-putt, that's all he needed. I thought he made it too. The way it was bending, I thought it was going to take a half a turn right and fall in. You could see just despondent from Will Zalatoris. Drops his putter, drops to his knees, head in his hands. A brutal moment for him and what an easy guy to root for. Ice in his veins. The the mental toughness from these guys, again, so it's minus six for Matthew Fitzpatrick. Congratulations to him. Scotty Scheffler, who continues to be an absolute machine. Uh, at minus five to go along with Will Zalatoris, both guys T2 for them. The mental toughness is unbelievable. You look in all three of these guys, there's moments I want to go through. You look at 11, uh, Matthew Fitzpatrick's coming off a bogey, hole 11, he gets a look from Will Zalatoris' putt. Zalatoris bangs it home for birdie. Fitzpatrick ends up overcooking his putt Pushes it wide left, leaves too much meat on the bone, misses the comebacker, three putts for bogey, two-shot swing. He then birdies 13, and then birdies 15 
with a bomb of a putt from way downtown. Epic moment. Then he goes on to make three straight pars. Even though on 18, he almost metoed it. And that's my, that's my adjective to describe what happens on 18 when you hit a bad drive that potentially loses you a major. Referring, of course, to Mito Pereira at the PGA Championship of a month ago. Messes his drive up, goes into a fairway bunker, then hits an all-world shot to the green for a comfortable two-putt. How to look at birdie. It's not just the ability to hit that shot. It's the mental toughness to calm yourself and then go do it. Again, I've talked to you a number of times in this show. I'm, about, I'm the mental midget who... I'm the mental midget who finishes his round on 18 and is still stressed out about the three putt on hole three that derails me for four rounds before I finally get it for four holes before I finally get it back together. But it wasn't just him. It was Scotty Scheffler. First hole, dynamite drive, bombs down the fairway, ball rolls into a divot. So many golfers on tour would show up and bemoan the fact that they got unlucky and, oh, how am I going to figure this out? And if you don't hit a good shot, they automatically can point to that and say, well, I got screwed. He looks at it and hits it to four feet. Unbelievable. Quick tangent. My one, I would say about my, my golf rule change, I don't care who you are, whether you're 12 handicap, 25 handicap, amateur, college player, the best tour pro, Scotty Scheffler, world number one. If you're in the fairway and your, balls rolls, your ball rolls into a divot, you should be able to move it out of the divot. I don't understand like, why you wouldn't be able to. Like, that's just a, a, a level of being unlucky that shouldn't be in the game because you already have took a bad bounce instead of bouncing into the fairway, it bounces into the rough or a bunker or, or bounces through the green. There's lucky bounces and unlucky bounces that are already such a an integral part of the game, especially a major with conditions as tough as what they are facing at the country club. Give them, let them bump the ball either straight back out of the divot or left or right. Why not? Scheffler, absolute nails. Um, and then you have Will Zalatoris who started woefully. Bogey two, bogey three. He's two over through three. Comes back to birdie. Six, seven, nine, and 11. And after two bir- uh, bogeys on 12 and 15, comes back and makes birdie on 16. The mental toughness of these guys, absolutely unbelievable. Not only the ability to make pars, but, but save bogey in bad situations and avoid the doubles. An absolutely breathtaking afternoon at the country club in what was a memorable, memorable U.S. Open. Congrats to Matthew Fitzpatrick, a deserving winner. An absolute stud, 15 to 1 uh, at win bet. Other shops had him uh, much higher. So a lot of people could have cashed in. I bet just threw some small money on him at, at plus 300, three to one as the round started. As Scheffler was getting going, I, I, I liked Matthew Fitzpatrick. He gets the job done. I hope Will Zalatoris' day is coming. It is, but I hope it comes soon because this guy is a deserving champion and, and, and just an easy kind of root for. I love him. Uh, and it was really tough to see the disappointment, and understandably so, for him yesterday. Again, once again, a bridesmaid to Matthew Fitzpatrick this time around at the U.S. Open. Let's talk a little NHL, just uh, recap what's happened so far. The Avs are an absolute wagon. 2-0 is the series. Game one went to overtime. Game two did not. 7-0, the final, in favor of the home team. They just... Uh, they are so fast and so deep and so complete and everybody can score and you make a mistake, they capitalize. Your line change isn't perfect, they capitalize. Being able to keep up with them and skate with them for 60 minutes and ultimately beat them not just once but four times just feels like an impossibility. Even for, obviously, a team as, ta- as talented as the Lightning who are trying to win their third straight. Kale McCarr with two goals. 3-0 at the end of the first. We might be talking sweep here. Uh, game three is on Monday night. The Lightning at minus 110. Avs at minus 110. A coin flip there. Total set at six. With the Avs team total set at three. Go check that out uh, if you are looking to bet on it. I, I think if you can 
Why not take the Avs? They are very evidently the better team. Um, hopefully the Lightning can win and, and, and at least make this somewhat of a series, but a sweep does feel very much in the cards in the Stanley Cup Finals. I think everyone, for as good as the NHL playoffs have been, they've been awesome. It does feel like everyone's known the inevitability of the Avs raising the cup at, when it's all said and done, and certainly through two games, that looks to be the case. Uh, promo time. We've got a new one here for you. Win bets ultimately fantasy, ultimate, ultimately, the ultimately ultimate, ultimate fantasy football experience. All new win bet users uh, can bet $500 or more on sports or casino and be entered into a prize drawing to have their fantasy football draft at the Encore Beach Club right here at the win in Las Vegas with up to 11 of your friends. 12 people total. Get that 12. We don't mess around with eight team leagues nor 10 team leagues. Get the 12 team league. Bring everybody here for the draft. Uh, all WinBet users can bet $500 or more again on sports or casino to be entered. Go to winbet.com or download the WinBet app for official rules and details. Winning pick time. Uh, I said I was going to try to avoid the losing streak. Your boy's in a losing streak. We're going to own it. Started off June with two wins. Uh, now rattle off three straight losses. Minus 0.95 units. That's manageable. That's one win to get us right back to even. And we're going to do it here on Monday. We're going to get it over even because I got a plus money play for you on the diamond going back to baseball. I'm taking the Mets run line at minus one and a half. The, the money line was juiced over minus 150. I'm taking the run line at plus 127 at home against the Marlins. Here is why. Trevor Rogers, the Marlins ace, not good this year. Absolutely woeful. He's got a 5.87 ERA with 11 earned runs over his last three starts. And the Mets ranked 12th in weighted runs created. WRC plus against left-handed pitching. They've been very good against lefties this year. Mets starter David Peterson. He's been okay. Hasn't been great lately. A 3.6 ERA, but the Marlins are dead last in WRC plus against lefties. Woeful against left-handed pitching. I like the edges there for the Mets. And of course, lineup-wise, Give me Francisco Lindor and Pete Alonso and Starling Marte over what the Marlins are trotting out there. Monday, baseball, Mets run line, minus one and a half against the Marlins at plus 127. That's going to do it for this episode of the show. Appreciate you joining us as always on Thursday. Going to do a deep dive into the NBA draft, which happens on Thursday night. The next generation of NBA stars coming to the association. Looking forward to that. We'll see you then right here on Bet to Win.